So you want to be a police officer in New Mexico. Maybe you're an officer from another state and you just accepted a job as an officer here in New Mexico. Maybe you're a brand new officer. You're about to go to the police academy. Well, there's a few things that every officer must know about New Mexico law, especially when it comes to search and seizure. In this episode of the podcast, I'm going to break down five things that every officer in New Mexico must know right now. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm attorney Eric Scramlin, and this is the Tactical In-Service Podcast, a podcast for law enforcement where I break down training topics and case law to help you, the law enforcement community, stay up on the law. Today's episode is a request from a friend of mine here at a local uh, sheriff's, sheriff's office here in southeast New Mexico. So if you're not a New Mexico officer... Probably a lot of the stuff I talk about in this episode is not going to be entirely helpful to you, but you still might take some value out of it if you're an officer that's thinking about coming to New Mexico. A lot of great job uh, opportunities out here for law enforcement, but there are some things about New Mexico law you need to know, and that's what I'm going to discuss in today's episode. Um, The reason why I decided to do this episode, also not just because my, my buddy requested it, is because he was noticing as the training coordinator something that I've noticed for years as a prosecutor and in, in doing this training company is that we have officers that come to New Mexico all the time from other states, some of them with significant experience. And we see this problem with younger officers too because you're only getting a day or two of search and seizure at the academy. So we're looking to outside sources for help. And those outside sources usually come in the form of other companies or research on the internet where you're learning United States Supreme Court case law. What I'm going to explain today in this episode is how New Mexico is one of a few states out there that has a drastically different approach to search and seizure and how you must be familiar with New Mexico specific law, especially with search and seizure, because New Mexico treats it much differently than the Supreme Court treats Fourth Amendment analysis. We don't always follow the Fourth Amendment. We have specific case law for our own state constitution. But before I get started, if you haven't already done so, I'd ask you to please hit the subscribe button. I have a ton of more of these episodes coming out. I have a few other topics and some interviews coming up. I want you guys to have that value, so make sure you hit subscribe. Follow the podcast if you're listening to it, so you'll get the notification as soon as these new episodes come out. I also want to mention, if you're taking value from this podcast, I offer, and this is my flagship course, full eight-hour search and seizure, New Mexico-specific case law. You can find out more information on my website at tacticalattorney.com. So give me a call. I'd love to come to your department and do the full eight-hour version of essentially what I'm going to be talking about here today in 10 to 15 minutes. All right, so... Let's jump in and get started. The first thing that I want to talk about is a lot of officers don't understand the reason why the law is so much different here in New Mexico. Why doesn't New Mexico follow the Carroll Doctrine? Why can't you search in trash that's been put out on the curb? Why is it so different here? Well, in order to understand that, in order for anything to make sense that I'm going to tell you today, you have to understand New Mexico... Our Supreme Court has adopted what's known as the interstitial approach. And you can can go and look this up. I'm going to leave a link to all the cases that I talk about today in the description below. And the case I'm talking about is State v. Gomez, which is a New Mexico Supreme Court decision from 1997, 122 New Mexico, 777. In that case, Supreme Court talked about how throughout the country, every state's got its own constitution. And there's essentially three approaches that a state Supreme Court can adopt. And I'm talking specifically about constitutional uh, analysis here, specifically with the Fourth Amendment. Most states, if you're an officer from California, Texas, where I'm at, Michigan, most states follow what we call either a primacy or a lockstep method where state Supreme Courts will simply follow what the United States Supreme Court says. United States Supreme Court comes up with Carroll Doctrine, they follow Carroll Doctrine. United States Supreme Court uh, comes up with cats, we follow cats. They don't add anything to it. New Mexico is very unique. It's one of few states that have adopted a third type of analysis, which I mentioned called the interstitial approach. 
In a nutshell, the interstitial approach says the Fourth Amendment federal constitution provides basic rights, but states are allowed to supplement and give extra rights under its own constitution. Like I said, New Mexico is one of few states that does that. We call it the interstitial approach. And the result is, under New Mexico's constitution, and every officer, you should know this, Article 2, Section 10, that's New Mexico's version of the Fourth Amendment. That's the law that you need to be familiar with is New Mexico law interpreting Article 2, Section 10. And it's drastically different than what we see at a lot of United States Supreme Court decisions, which is interpreting the Fourth Amendment under the federal constitution. So that's why it's different here. Our Supreme Court, if you read any case involving search and seizure, they will start the analysis by saying, did the officer violate a right under the Fourth Amendment? And if you're good there, then part two of the analysis is, did they violate Article 2, Section 10, in which we give greater rights? So that's how every case will start out when it comes to search and seizure. You got to be familiar with that second part. How does it work? How does it apply here in New Mexico? So that's the reason why. Now, what are some examples of that? As I mentioned, I want to talk about uh, five topics. So topic number one was what is the interstitial approach? Topic number two, what every officer must know, where we see a big difference starting right out is when it comes to interpreting reasonable expectation of privacy. So under the Fourth Amendment, the landmark case out there is United States versus Katz. And United States versus Katz, our Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, moved away from its interpretation of when does the Fourth Amendment apply. The old interpretation from Olmstead way back in the 20s was the Fourth Amendment applied to places. It prevented the government from physically intruding onto your property and into your house. Katz took a different approach, and it said... We think the Fourth Amendment applies to people, not just places. And they said the Fourth Amendment will apply when a person has a reasonable expectation of privacy and the government intrudes on that reasonable expectation of privacy. What are some examples? The house. The government looks into your house with infrared devices like they did in Kylo. They're intruding on your reasonable expectation of privacy. Contrast that if you take garbage and put it in a trash bag and move it from your curtilage onto the curb in a public area, then you have no reasonable expectation of privacy in that because you've moved it out there where it's sort of open to the public now. If you left your curtains wide open and you have a bunch of windows in your house and you could see from the sidewalk that you don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy because you've left it open. New Mexico has taken the idea of reasonable expectation of privacy and they've sort of put it on steroids. So we see examples under New Mexico law where we get much greater reasonable expectation of privacy rights than what the United States uh, Supreme Court has interpreted. So one example of that is when it comes to the vehicle. If you're an officer from another state, you're probably familiar with what we call the Carroll Doctrine, where the Supreme Court said if you have probable cause to believe there's evidence of a crime, contraband inside of a readily mobile vehicle in a public place, you can search it without a warrant. New Mexico has rejected the Carroll Doctrine. We treat vehicles as an extension of the home. That means the same exceptions that apply to a house apply to a vehicle. That means under New Mexico law, you cannot search a vehicle if you just have probable cause. You have to have probable cause plus exigent circumstances, or you would be doing an inventory or something like that, but you don't get that Carroll Doctrine, which allows you to search a car just because you have probable cause. That's a big difference under New Mexico law. Another big uh, area of difference is what we see in State versus Granville, 2006, NMCA 0, I'm sorry, NMCA 98, leave a link down below again. State versus Granville, United, uh, the New Mexico Supreme Court said, yeah, it's fine if we're going to look in the trash and the curb from the under Fourth Amendment analysis, but when they went to analyzing it under our own state constitution, they said, you don't abandon your reasonable expectation of privacy. People still retain a reasonable expectation of privacy in their trash, even when it's at the curb. In another case, they even went so far as to say, you maintain an expectation of privacy when you put it even in a dumpster at a motel parking lot. So there's many examples that you have to be familiar with under New Mexico law where you wouldn't necessarily need a warrant if you just look at Fourth Amendment law from the U.S. Supreme Court, but if you look at New Mexico law, 
We have greater reasonable expectation of privacy interests in things that you wouldn't expect, like the vehicle and trash. And we see it pop up from time to time, like my next topic, which is number three, scope of a traffic stop. All right, under Fourth Amendment, if you're from a state that follows the Fourth Amendment, it's pretty clear. If you stop someone for speeding, turn signal, doesn't matter what it is, you can ask them whatever you want as long as it doesn't unreasonably extend the stop. So if you stop someone for speeding, how long does it take a reasonable officer to write a speeding ticket? 10, maybe 15 minutes, something like that. You can ask them whatever you want as long as you don't go outside of that objectively reasonable time that it takes an officer. So you got 10 to 15 minutes. You can ask them, where are you coming from? Do you have drugs in the car? Can I have consent to search? Have you been drinking? Whatever. doesn't matter. New Mexico, this is probably the, the biggest area, and this is an area where I've had a lot of suppression issue as a drug prosecutor, was you make a traffic stop. New Mexico law doesn't follow Fourth Amendment. They require that you have reasonable suspicion to ask about that other crime. So, for example, if you stop someone for speeding, you can only ask questions about speeding. If you stop someone for a turn signal violation, you can only ask questions related to the turn signal violation. The only way you can ask additional questions about some other crime is if you develop reasonable suspicion during the scope of that original stop, then you can expand into it. So an example would be if you stop someone for a turn signal violation. You're limited to only asking questions about a turn signal violation, which really isn't much, right? You can always ask for license, registration, but you can't ask consent to search because you think there's drugs in the car. You can't ask them about, hey, are you coming from that drug house over there? Those are outside of the scope, and if that leads to anything, it'll get suppressed. So an example would be you stop someone for the turn signal violation. They roll down the window. You smell the odor of intoxicating alcohol, they have bloodshot, watery eyes, slurring their speech, what have you just done? You've developed reasonable suspicion within that scope that they're DWI. So you can now expand into the DWI investigation. So you got to remember that. Recently in State versus Teuton, an officer stopped someone for a turn signal violation and asked, where are you coming from? And the person gave a name that the officer recognized as someone that was in the drug game. Asked consent to search, found drugs. It was all suppressed because the court ruled when the officer asked, where are you coming from? It was not related to the reason for the stop, which was a turn signal violation and therefore violated New Mexico's constitution. So that's a big area if you're an officer from another state that you may not be used to that you'll have to get used to under New Mexico law. All right, the fourth area is inventory. And this is an interesting area because up until this year, New Mexico did not apply the interstitial approach to inventories. They simply followed the Fourth Amendment to the T. But this year they changed that. They held in State versus Jim that an officer cannot search a locked container in a vehicle during an inventory even if the policy and procedure allows it. Now under Fourth Amendment case law, it's clear you can search locked containers during an inventory as long as your policies and procedures allow for it, you're lawfully obtained the vehicle and all that. New Mexico very recently has said, we're going to apply the interstitial approach, meaning we're going to give greater rights under the state constitution. And they ruled that the officer could not search the locked container. So now even the inventory exception is subject to these greater rights. Finally, Topic number five, what every officer must know, is recently New Mexico passed HB4, House Bill 4, also known as the New Mexico Civil Rights Act. Now, I'm going to do just a quick, tell you a couple quick things about this. If you want more information, I did a full video. I'm going to have it scroll up here where I explain what you need to know about the New Mexico Civil Rights Act. Essentially, what it did is it created a cause of action where citizens can sue the government for violations of the New Mexico Constitution. So these aren't lawsuits that get filed in federal court like a 1983 action would be. They're going to state court, relying on state law. So you could follow the Fourth Amendment, not violate anything that the Supreme Court has given protections to. The Supreme Court for the United States could say, hey, you can search a car if you got probable cause under the Carroll Doctrine. But that violates New Mexico's constitution, which would give someone the ability to sue your agency 
based on that state violation. They also abolished qualified immunity. They really didn't. I, I explain why in the video if you check it out. But the important thing to know about it is it does create a cause of action. Agencies are getting sued. And you must know New Mexico law. You can't go to out-of-state training and simply trust what they tell you there. You can't research United States Supreme Court case law because a lot of it doesn't apply here. You must be familiar with the New Mexico law because you could totally be in compliance with Fourth Amendment, but you violate New Mexico's constitution. You've subjected your department, your agency to a lawsuit. And we don't want to do that for a number of reasons. Of course, it's it's not good for you. It's not good for your community. What I have learned for any of you that are going to become an officer here in New Mexico, you don't ask, how do I get around it? This sucks. That's simply not the approach. As a drug prosecutor, we got convictions. And we got there by doing everything the right way. I taught our task force guys in depth, they knew the law better than the defense attorneys on New Mexico search and seizure law. They did everything right. They did it just like our Supreme Court told us to do it, and they couldn't touch us, and we had airtight cases. That's what you want to do. That's what you want to focus on. If you're going to be a, an officer in New Mexico, it's different. It's tougher. It's a challenge. But get familiar with these cases, these five areas that I talked about. There are more. But these are the big ones. I hope this helps shed a little bit of light on it. And if you are a new officer in New Mexico, or if you're a training coordinator and you want me to come in, just go to my website at tacticalattorney.com. You can find out about my courses there. Give me a call. I'd love to come in and, and share all of this, this information with your agency. Remember, everybody, every battle is won before it's fought. Thank you, guys. Hit the subscribe button. I'll see you on the next episode. Stay safe.